Um, thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, I hope you have a good time last night. Um, this is my first time in uh, Insomniac and in Switzerland, so I'm a little bit uh, excited. And by the way, before I will start, I just want to know how many of you use Docker? Oh, nice. Because like four years ago, it wasn't like that. And how many of you use Docker for Windows? Okay, less. <laughs> so one year ago, something like this, my manager uh, asked me to do a, a research about Windows containers. And I told him uh, why no one is using it. So he told me this is why we, we are paying you for. So I did the research. And in this research, actually, this wasn't the main research because I needed to use Docker to, to run the Windows containers. And while I did so, we found a number of issues um, that I think you should be aware of when you are using Docker for Windows. So uh, a little bit about myself. My name is Vital Gerzi. I'm a security researcher at uh, CyberArk. Before CyberArk, I worked on uh, mostly on uh, Windows uh, research. And today, my main focus is on um, DevOps security, Kubernetes, containers, things like that. And today, we are going to speak, first thing, a little bit about container, Docker, and name pipes. Then we will uh, speak about <clears throat> some vulnerable undocumented API inside a specific name pipe. Later, we will show the vulnerabilities that we found in the exploitation process. And lastly, we will do some summary of the things. So um, let's start. So before, uh, I don't know how many of you know, but um, um, uh, before, like before explaining what is container, uh, I want to talk about the history. Container is not new thing. It was in 1979. If you are, if you are familiar with the uh, term churut. So it was back then, and over the years were a couple of uh, companies that made some implementation of containers. And the, um, I think uh, the LXC was more popular in 2008. And in 2013, Docker came up with a nice system to run containers uh, quite easily and uh, in a friendly way, and it uh, became very popular, mostly on Linux. And in 2016, actually it was 2015 in Ignite where Microsoft introduced the Windows containers. So today you can run Windows containers and Linux containers on a Windows system. Now, what is a container? So container is a lightweight, portable, self-contained environment for running a software application. And it provides you a way to run the application and its dependencies. Um, and you can run it across uh, different um, different environments without the need of a separate operating system or virtual machine. The good thing on this is that you can uh, it runs isolated, so you can do uh, you can do things inside the container, but it won't affect the host. And the way uh, it's isolated is because uh, usually in Linux it uses uh, C groups, which is control groups and the uh, namespace to make this separation. It also runs quickly. Uh, you don't, it's not like a virtual machine that you need to run the kernel every time. So you run, you run it, uh, and it uses the kernel resources. So this is the reason for it, for why it runs quickly and reliably because the container uh, has all the dependencies and everything inside it. So if you compile your application inside the container, you can send it to your friend and it will, uh, you, it will run probably in most of the cases without any issues, without any li ex external library that he, need to, he needs to install. So, uh, uh, like I said, in 2015, Microsoft uh, introduced the they incorporate with Docker to make uh, Windows containers in Windows host. And they call it uh, Docker Desktop. This is why uh, d d when I started research, I needed to install Docker Desktop and work with it. And when I installed it, I noticed that there are lots of processes in the system. And two of them were um, very interesting. There was, was the Docker D, which is the Docker daemon, 
uh, also from Linux. They only gave support to, to Windows. This is an open source. But the new thing was a new service called uh, Comdocker Service, which is uh, unique to Windows, of course. Now, if you look on the, um, on the Docker desktop architect architecture in, um, in high level, <clears throat> so you have the Docker desktop, which is uh, the GUI application that you can run as a low privilege user, and it communicates with the Comdocker service, uh, which is a privilege uh, service, which communicates with the Docker daemon, another privilege service, and then it's create or run the container, whatever. And what I was interested uh, in was the, um, the communication between the Docker desktop to the service, because you have a low privileged uh, application that communicates with the Chrome Docker service, and I think you already know how they communicate because I had uh, the title, so it's a named pipe, which uh, it's a very basic and simple technology that enables communication and share data between two processes. And um, the term pipe is simply described the section of shared memory used between these two processes, two or more processes. So one can write to the pipe and the other can read, things like that. And in uh, Docker, you have lots of uh, name pipes uh, that they are using to communicate with. So of course you can... Uh, list all the name pipes on the system, but I wasn't, I, 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 I was, I wanted to be sure that I see all the name pipes. So I started with static analysis because this is a C sharp application. So it was easy to reverse and also a dynamic analysis with Ion Ninja, which if you're not familiar is a great tool for things like that. So I saw all the name pipes and it was like something like approximately 40 name pipes. And this is only part, a, li a small part of the list in the blog post that we uh, published. There is a, a, all the full list. And one of them was very interesting. It was the, the name pipe of the Docker service, which by the way, uh, there is another name pipe, which they, uh, it's called the same uh, name, but with a debug. Uh, I didn't check it yet, but um, this is the one that was running. And when we did this research, I thought it also can be a good thing to make a, a new tool called the Pipe Viewer that can list me all the name pipes and can show me all the details on the name pipes. By the way, it's, uh, it's based on the work from uh, James Forshaw. So you can see all the um, permissions, and we're planning to add more features to this tool. But what you can see here is that we have the Docker backend v2 name pipe, and we, there is read and write permissions to a group called uh, Docker users. Now, um, this group is, seems to be like a not privileged group, but there is a problem well, with this group because it's indirectly it's privileged group. And I will explain why. So after we reported, like five months, I think, after uh, our reporting, they published, Docker published a documentation and they explained that the common Docker service is a system run with system privileges and uh, where you have the name pipe. And in the last row, they mentioned that um, the name pipe is protected and only the users that are part of the Docker users group have access to it. So what is the problem? Um, the problem is that, okay, you can't create privileged containers on Windows. It, uh, actually, you can in Kubernetes, but it's something else. But with Docker, you can't do it. It's not supported, maybe, yet. So, But you can do something else. You can, for example, in this, I have a low privilege user that tries to write to see Windows. He can't do it, but he can run um, a container with mount from the C Windows to see Windows 2 inside the container. And from inside the container, he can write to the C Windows 2, which redirects it to the host C windows. So basically, if you have, if you can run Windows containers, you have, uh, you can escalate your privilege to system by design. So this is the main problem. And, but that, don't worry, um, they, they have a solution. Um, they have a flag, no Windows containers, which means that you, if you want to prevent it, just don't run Windows containers. Um, so it's a bit a problem. And by the way, the vulnerabilities that we found don't care about this flag because we found vulnerabilities on the uh, on the API. 
And one weird thing that I checked in the WSL, because you can run Windows containers in Windows and you can run Linux containers in Windows. So when I connected to the Docker desktop distribution on the WSL, I couldn't try to see Windows um, um, directly. So I'm not sure why, because they could um, prevent it, like prevent uh, mounting from a low privilege user to the C Windows. So um, if you still want to use Windows containers, their response was that it's outside of their control and they're not going to fix it. So if you have, um, if you give someone um, the permission to run Docker uh, Windows containers, so be aware of that. And while this was a, a main issue, I want to speak about other issues that we found. Again, one requirement that you need to be the, in the Docker users group. And now we will see how we can, how we abused some of the um, uh, APIs. So um, the first thing that I started was going over the com Docker service. And I saw that it started the Docker backend uh, v2 name pipe. But um, the main of the code of the com Docker service wasn't uh, too much interesting. So I looked uh, on its uh, dependencies libraries, um, Docker Core and Docker Backend. And inside them, uh, I saw this function called resolve a uh, pipe async, which uh, creates the Docker Backend v2 as a name pipe HTTP client. So which means that we have something like REST API. And when we looked inside the, more of the code in the Docker backend the DLL, I saw all the, all the routes and all the sub routes. Like in this example, DNS, and you have the sub route refresh hosts. And you can uh, communicate with each other of, of them. So I mapped, uh, I like to map things, so I mapped all the, all the APIs. This is only the smallest. I have a, the second part will be later in the presentation, but in the in the blog we have the full one. So when I looked, the first thing that I noticed was the, this function that called move data folder that you can move files from old directory to new directory with privileged, you know, system privileges. So it doesn't go into a good place. So the thing that uh, the first thing that you want to do is just to move files, right, to check it. So. Uh, this was the first um, um, vulnerability. And b by the way, it's really nice that you have also in the code how to call the function. So you don't need to work out. You can just uh, take the, the classes and use it in your uh, exploit. And then I looked on the move that folder function on the logic. And you, it requires you to use a Docker a desktop VHDX file. And later it used uh, it doing the file dot move, but I will save you these times and go for the logic. So the first thing is that the root directory and the subdirectory, if any, must have a file named docker desktop dot vhdx. The second thing is that from the root directory, only a file named docker desktop vhdx will be moved, but from the subdirectories, all the files will be moved. And this is a small diagram of how it works. If you will notice, the, the A dot text wasn't moved to the, like it's, I'm calling the move data folder from ABC to XYZ, but only the, this A dot text wasn't moved. And we control the content. So the next part was, of course, to try to move it to C Windows, and it uh, moved without any problem. Not just that, that we have uh, full permissions on the file, uh, delete, rename, and by the way, if you are interested in why we had permission and why it didn't inherit the permissions from the C windows, it's because uh, Microsoft, have, they have some exception when you move files, when you move uh, an object to a different folder on the same volume. So the original permissions retained, and you can read more about it. So we have a file that we can move to a protected place. So my plan was uh, make some DLL hijack with a known spooler DLL hijack uh, UAL API. And uh, so the only thing that I needed to do is to change the name, of course, but um, you can change the name inside the protected uh, path uh, because of the Windows file protection. 
So after uh, thinking about it uh, a little bit, um, if you are familiar with uh, another, by the way, it's amazing work of James Foshaw, uh, Simlink, which still work in Windows 11. Um, so you can use this technique to uh, change the name. And how it works is like that. I'm calling the move data folder from ABC to some temp jumper, and the ABC contains my malicious DLL file in the um, wrapped with the name of Docker Desktop VHDX. Then when I will call it, it will go to the jumper, which is a junction folder, which will point to an object manager symlink, which will eventually um, redirect it to the to the name that I want. So great, we have the we can we control the name, the content, the the place, everything. So we only need now to restart the computer. This is what it required from the uh, spooler uh, to turn uh, the DLL hijack. Um, yes, but um, my question was if we can trigger it without a restart because it's not nice for the PRC, you know, to start restart the computer. It's not. So uh, there is a great article by um, Alex Unesco and Jordan Shafir. I really recommend it to read it. Basically, it talks about the idea that a low-privileged user can start some uh, services which run uh, with network service uh, privileges, and they showed how they can escalate the privileges from network service to system. So I used uh, their uh, article to do it, and this is what we... No, not like that. Okay, so this is what this is the full exploit. First thing, I'm running on Windows 11. I'm checking um, the update. It's a full update running the, again. Yeah, the most updated version. In that time, it was a couple of months ago. I will start the CMD. I will show that I don't have permissions. I a low privilege user. I will try to write to see Windows, just if you don't believe me. Yeah, access denied. And then I will go to my exploit uh, folder and run the POC. And it's just it's just doing everything that uh, I spoke about, symlink and everything. And in the end, it triggered the um, DLL hijack. And then we get the shell and we get the system. So it was really... Um, yeah, like, nice to do it. I, I also verified again, right to the, to the A, just to make sure that uh, you see it works. So anyway, this was the first vulnerability. And the second one was about a, a object named Daemon JSON. And this is uh, another interesting thing. We have two methods, start and stop that we can start and stop the Docker daemon service. And not only that, we can start the service with the configuration that we want. So um, if you go to the start you, uh, function, you can see that we have a, an object named daemon JSON. And basically this daemon JSON is a string of the uh, configuration uh, for the Docker daemon. And then it called for a function called the rewrite option, which writes the configuration to a file. And uh, later it uh, adds the file to the config file switch. And then you have the Docker daemon runs with a daemon.json file, which contains the configuration that we entered inside the daemon.json object. So um, let's see, there were two vulnerabilities inside this daemon.json that we found. The first one is the data root, which allow us to get the arbitrary file override on any file. And this is the list of all the fields that you have. And I go over all the fields and there were some strange things uh, there that I played with, but I will show only the interesting one. So we have the data root. Data root is a, is a path that um, saves all the um, configuration files of Docker uh, in the place that you will tell him. So I made uh, a JSON uh, string called the uh, C data root, and then I call the start API C data root. It created the data root folder, but I didn't have uh, access because the Comdocker service created the folder with system permission. Uh, it, it wasn't used to for someone to do it, uh, for a low privilege user to do it. 
but uh, actually there is a way to bypass it because if you create it first manually and then call it, and then it's okay. So then you have access. Now, after you go over all the files, there was an interesting file that called the local KV DB. And again, the first thing that uh, pops up to my mind, privilege, uh, a service rights, a file, uh, theme link. Okay. Let's try again. Uh, so I delete the file, only the folder with the file. Call again the start API. It created, now this is a talk to attack, a race condition, because when it creates the folder, I need to delete the folder and create it as a junction folder before it creates the local KV file. And it took me like, uh, when I run the exploit, it takes like three, four tries to do it, but it works uh, all the time. And then again, uh, object manager theme link. And then I can write to any place. I won't show a demo because uh, it's, um, I think, straightforward. We have all the demos in the blog post. But I want to talk on the second interesting vulnerability, with, which is the PID file uh, vulnerability, which allowed us to write any file and delete any file. Again, PID file is uh, in Docker. It's a way that uh, the Docker daemon stores the process ID inside uh, a file which I don't think it was intended for Windows because it, this is how they're doing, doing it in uh, Linux, but it still have it uh, because the Docker daemon is like a uh, cross platform. So it still work only on, also in uh, Windows. And again, I, I just put the, the name of the file, call it, it create a file. And if I, de if I stop the service, it delete the file. So, okay. So we have the vulnerability. You can see it with Pokemon. Okay. So we have, we have a write and delete. Can we do something else with it? So there is a way that you can leverage a delete file to full uh, privilege escalation. It's not 100% of the time, but in some condition it will work. And this is based off an amazing, another amazing article that I again um, recommended to read from the Zero Day Initiative. Um, that they show uh, how to do it. And there are a couple of requirements. The first thing is that the vulnerable process uh, should call delete file A or delete file W. The second thing is the ability to delete or rename an empty folder called cconfig.msi. And lastly, the way you delete a folder with delete file, you use a, a stream called index allocation, and then you can delete the folder. And so, I checked what if we have uh, all the requirements, and the first thing uh, I saw that we have the we are using the, the Docker daemon is using the delete file w, and the idea was to now just to delete the folder and then use the technique that they explained in the uh, article. So I called the start, uh, the start for the Docker daemon with this speed file. But uh, I had a problem because it tried to create a folder which is already exist. And uh, if you think how to bypass it, yeah, you create right. Uh, again, Simlink. Um, Microsoft should fix it. Um, so we call the start API for a different file, something like uh, temp.txt. We don't care about it. And then we delete it and create it as a junction folder. And then it will uh, and, and call the stop API because the stop will delete the file and the stop will be redirected to the, to the folder. And by the way, I, it's important to mention, if you will check this config uh, MSI file, uh, usually it might, like, it might be not empty. In most of the cases, there are some, uh, um, I don't, I won't say random files, but there are some uh, RB scripts inside it. I tried to brute force it because I have delete for the file, so I needed to guess the name, but it was not efficient enough. If you find a way, so it's it's great. And, but in uh, Windows 11, when, in the fresh Windows 11, you don't even have the folder, so it was easier. And anyway, if you delete this file, you create the config file and put your uh, R malicious RB script, and then you use the, this is from, by the way, from the, again, from the article, so you can read more about it. They uh, put a malicious uh, HID DLL, and then they use their own screen keyboard to switch to secure desktop. And this is the second one that uh, from a delete file, you can uh, leverage it to uh, 
full uh, privilege escalation. Again, I'm checking the Windows 11 and the updated version. Don't worry, this is the last demo. And uh, again, who am I? Not privileged. I'm trying to delete the config MSI. I can't. Access denied. Uh, by the way, I, okay, I, I made this... Uh, because in Windows 10, uh, 11, you don't have the folder, so it was easier, but I wanted to make it more uh, challenging, so I created the one with the access denied. I just showed you that if I open the keyboard, nothing happened. Again, going to my exploit uh, folder, run the exploit. It uh, starts the service and create the same link, and later it will uh, delete it and use the exploit based on the uh, zero day, day initiative uh, uh, POC. And after that, it should uh, put the HAD DLL. Uh, they asked to, they said, yeah, to put, to start the OSK from the secure desktop. And then you have, uh, again, system uh, CMD. So this is another way that you can leverage it from the delete file to full uh, privilege escalation. And Lastly, I will talk about, um, this is a quick one because this is again the same issues, but, um, we're talking and uh, I will talk about them also. So there is another controller called Hyper-V controller. Um, it has a, a function called create and destroy. So the first one, the create one, you can use it to arbitrary, uh, file overwrite. This is how it looks. And it uses, it calls a create or config, a configure sync uh, function, which receives a settings object. And this settings object, um, if you will notice, there is a, like the data folder. So you, we control the data folder, but they add the Docker desktop VHDX file to the, to the path. So if you will just run it like this, like with the data folder of C Windows, it will create C Windows Docker Desktop VHDX, but if you you will use a symlink, you can again bypass it like I show. So I won't show it again. And the last thing was uh, the delete another delete file that we found. That again same thing, same data folder, but now they are calling to the destroy function. And then we I saw that it deletes any file that I want with the with the that ends with Docker Desktop VHDX. And if I use again symlink, I can delete any file that I want. I didn't check if I can do a, like I did before with the, um, uh, to make it, to leverage it because I was too lazy for that. But I, I suppose it's possible. So let's, um, summarize this. Um, so Docker, uh, Windows containers allow you to get uh, system privileges and it won't going to fix. I'm not talking about the vulnerabilities that I found. I'm talking about the main issue that you can mount uh, a protected path to a, inside a container and then write to it. You can use the flag no Windows containers, but uh, it, then you can turn Windows containers. So what is the point? Um, you, there is a link to the pipe viewer uh, tool that we wrote, so you can use it and play with this. Uh, we already released the first blog. We are planning to s release the second one I hope in the last of this month, uh, like in April, sorry. And these are the list of the CVs that we found. These are the references for the Faxel uh, um, article by Arden and Alex, again, uh, by viewer, uh, Zero Day Initiative and Simlink Attacks, that you can read more about it. And um, that's it. So, so if you have... Um, question or things like that, feel free to ask now. If, if you are shy, you can uh, later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we are going to open the Q&A que session. So if there is any question. Yes. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. For, well, th first of all, thanks for the great presentation. It was really interesting. So um, I have a question regarding the named pipes. Yeah. 
did I understand it correctly? The to interact with the pipes, Docker is offering some kind of REST API. Did I get yeah, that right? Yes, correct. Is this a common practice? Um, actually, it's my first time that I see mm -hmm. someone using name pipe as a REST API. Um, so I'm not sure if this is the best practice. Um, yeah, like it's a problem because when you saw it, there are lots of things that you can do and play with lots of API. So this, the attack surface is so big when you are seeing these things. So I'm not sure it's a good thing. Um, uh, I don't know, um, what better way can be to do it. But, uh, yeah, when I saw it, it was like, like a playground. I can, wow, so many things to play with. But it's, um, they, there's the group that they mentioned, the Docker users group. So you can say, okay, so if you are inside this group, like, uh, it's like an, maybe a privileged group because indirectly it's a privileged group. But then you have a problem because you still want to give your developers to be able to use contain, uh, containers, but they don't, maybe you don't want them to be administrators. So, uh, it's make things messy. Uh, so for your question, I'm I'm not sure it's the best best practice. So it's neither best practice nor common, right? Yeah. Okay. Common, I didn't see it, uh, but again, I, I'm not. I didn't see someone use it like this. Uh, the name pipe is REST API. It's my first time that I saw it. And this API was just used inter internally by the Docker service itself, right? Yeah, it was used by yeah by the com Docker service. And the, the GUI was communicate with it. I didn't check how it uses the API um, with all these um, features, by, uh, but uh, I, I saw that I can call it directly. So it's, for me, it was uh, okay. By the way, there, there are lots of other name pipes, but the only one, this one was interesting because you had uh, an option to affect a privileged service. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. You're welcome. <clears throat> Other question? Well, so if there is no other question, thank you very much, Aviatar Gazi, for this presentation. Thank you.